Shalom Chavrim, I'm Stephen Benoon with the Noon Institute of Biblical Research. The other day in one of the news uh, special reports that I was doing, I mentioned to you about the love of money. And that really got me to want to go back because God was just putting this in my heart, dealing with me about it. And so I thought, I must go back and really look at the scripture about this, not just the fact of money, but the word root because it is the root of all evil. The scripture that we actually looked at was as found in 1 Timothy 6.10, for the love of money is the root of all evil. All evil? That's, that's very huge to say that. Which while some coveted after they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. It really got me on a search because the Lord had already revealed to me what the real meaning of this passage was. It was a prophetic passage. And of course, I remembered many of the scriptures that speak about the Messiah, especially in prophetic in the prophetic tone. If you look, for example, in Isaiah 53, uh, starting with verse 1, we'll read through verse 5, Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no former comeliness when, uh, when we shall see him. There is no beauty that we should desire him. This is speaking of the Messiah, the coming Messiah. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And we did, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. How sad. He was despised and, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgression, transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Of course, there's beautiful scriptures there about the Messiah, especially the healing by his stripes were healed. He was bruised for our iniquities. He suffered so greatly. But the important part in this case here is he is, a, he is typed as a root out of dry ground. Then again, we have the other scriptures as well, especially... Um, where the, the scripture, uh, actually, let me see if I can, um, this one here, this is from the, I believe this is an Isaiah a prophecy here, and I forget which chapter, I think it's chapter 11, chapter 11, verse 10, and it shall come to pass in that day, then the King James, they worded this a little, they, they did, a, they did an inc a mistake in their translation, but let me go ahead and read it. That the root of Jesse, that standeth for an ensign of the peoples, unto it shall be shall the nation seek, and his resting place shall be glorious. Now, the word it is not written in Hebrew. It's actually unto him shall the nation nation seek. It's actually elav elav goim uh, The elav is unto him. Unto him uh, goim shall the Gentiles seek. And he is actually called the root of Jesse. So the Messiah is typed as the root. Again, we have in uh, Revelation chapter 5, And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and loose the seven seals. The root of David. Again, he's referred to as the root. He says in Revelation 26, 22, 16, this is when Yeshua is speaking, I, Yeshua, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and offspring of David and the bright and morning star. Now here's what's fascinating. If Yeshua, if the coming Messiah of 2,000 years ago was referred to in prophecy by the prophets of old as a, as a root. He was likened as the root. Also we find in, I believe it's in Romans 11, he is the root and we are the branches. It's not that we are the root. Israel is not the root. In fact, it clearly it says that because of unbelief, in part because of unbelief, in part because of blindness, 
Israel is, the branches are cut out of the tree. See, they're not the root. The root is what gives the life, and Christ is that root. So if Christ is the root as the Messiah, the anointed one, the Christ, Yeshua, if he is a root, then the Antichrist must also have a root as well. And that's where I found these interesting scriptures that identify. Now, let me, let's look back again at Timothy. Let's go to verse uh, 7. It's in chapter 6, 1 Timothy. He says, For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry, uh, carry nothing out. And having food and remnant, let us be there with content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. Wow. It drowns men in destruction and perdition. You know, the perdition, you know, Judas was called the son of perdition, and as well as the Antichrist would be called the son of perdition. Judas was the man that carried the money back. Interesting. And he was an apostle. Now, the Roman Catholic Church believes that the Pope of Rome is a successor to Peter. He is a successor of one of the apostles, but it's not Peter, it's Judas, because they still carry the money back. And it's true that he is a successor. Let's look and see how we know this. In verse 10, it says, For the love of money is the root of all evil. All, all the evil there is has a root, and that root is identified by the desire, and that is that love of money. And even the scripture says in one place about Judas, it wasn't that he cared about the poor, but he held the money back. It's the same thing with the Roman Catholic Church. If they really cared about the poor as the world tries to make it look like they do, then they would sell off the trillions of dollars of gold and feed the world instead of building all the idols. But they don't. They don't care about the poor. That's even, I don't just blame it on the Catholic Church. What about the mega billion dollars, a million dollar churches that are built? I mean, what about all the, what, what about the poor? What, you know, when's the last time you have tried to help someone that was in need? It's important. It's what Yeshua, it's the life that he lived. It's what he demonstrated to us that we help others. Anyway, it says, for the love of money is the root of all evil. Now, here's what's really interesting. Which while some coveted, they really desire it, after they have erred from the faith. They were actually part of the original walk with Christ like Judas was. And it's even, he's even, he, if that's not a direct statement about Judas, I, I'd be surprised. See, which while some coveted it, after they have erred from the faith. And pierced themselves through with many sorrows. This is exactly what the Catholic Church did. Oh yes, the early church fathers and stuff, they were offshoots of the Christianity. They were offshoots of the campaigns of the early apostles. And, and no doubt uh, could probably easily trace it back and could tell you which apostle was that apostle that witnessed to the one, maybe even a witness to them. But they coveted that money. And God was giving you a sign to know who it was that would had, in other words, the sign is, is the, the root of all evil is that one that has that love for money. Now it gets better than that. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 12. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springeth up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. A root of bitterness. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. Now Esau is identified with a root, and it's a root of bitterness. 
And bitterness is an evil, just like we have the, the, the love of money being the root of all evil. We know that in Obadiah, Obadiah clearly says, out of the Mount of Esau, uh, uh, chapter 1, verse 8, shall it not, not in that day, saith the Lord, even to destroy the wise men out of Edom and the understanding out of the Mount of Esau. Esau? Wait a minute. Let's see what it says. In that day, he's going to destroy the... the the, the understanding out of the Mount of Esau. What is the Mount of Esau then? And thy mighty men, O Teman, shall be dismayed to the end of every one. Uh, uh, let me back up. Let me, let me back up to verse 7 in Obadiah. All the men of thy confederacy, confederacy have brought thee even to the border. Border of what? To the border of Israel. The men that were at peace with thee have deceived thee. And prevailed against thee. They that eat thy bread have laid a wound under thee. There is none understanding in him. Shall I not in that day, saith the Lord, even destroy the wise men out of Edom? By the way, Edom was where Esau's children lived at. And understanding out of the mount of Esau. Now Esau's identified. And thy mighty men of Teman shall be dismayed to the end that every one of, of the mount of Esau may be cut off by slaughter. For thy violence against thy brother Jacob, shame shall cover thee, and thou shalt be cut off forever. Wait a minute. For thy violence against thy brother Jacob, shame shall cover thee, and thou shalt be cut off forever? There is no place where we see that Esau himself did any evil to his brother. When his brother came back in, he accepted him with open arms. At first he seemed to come down with vengeance, but then Jacob prevailed and became a prince with God, and he found grace in the sight of Esau, right? It's a spirit that moves down. It's a root. It's a root of bitterness. Because the Esau's descendants are still bitter against Israel. They're still bitter against Jacob. Watch what he says. Verse 10, for thy violence against thy... We read that one there. Verse 11, in that day thou... In that day that thou stoodest on the other side in the day that the strangers carried away captive his forces and foreigners into his gates and cast lots upon Jerusalem, even thou wast as one of them. Wow, wait a minute. Now that's putting Esau, his descendants at the time of what? At the time when Yeshua was here 2,000 years ago, at 70 AD. Wait a minute, I thought that David... And Saul killed all of Esau's descendants. According to the scripture in 2 Kings, all but one, Hadad. Hadad escapes. He's just a young child. He's taken down with some of, of, some of the others. He is of the royal seat of Esau. He's raised in the house of Pharaoh as a prince of Egypt. Interesting, just like Moses, isn't it? See, Moses was a type of, of Christ, the true Messiah. The, the antitype has to follow the same pattern that the Messiah goes in. So the antitype, which the antichrist of that day is Hadad, who's also raised in the house of Pharaoh. But instead of separating from Pharaoh, he does separate. He becomes the king of what? Syria. What do you know? But he never got rid of the idolatry. Moses forsook all the treasures and riches of Egypt to esteem, to see him that was invisible, Christ, Moshiach, Yeshua, but not Hadad. He goes up, he marries in, because why? He's already part Arabic in that part of the land anyway. He's already been married into that. Esau did that. It's his kindred. He goes up there, becomes the king of Syria. Later, even Jewish historians track him. His own descendants, they go into northern Africa, cross the channel into Rome, and that's where the descendants are. And now the Bible tracks it as well because God puts the Mount of Esau in Rome. How do we know this? He says, In that day thou shouldest not stand on the other side, in that day that the strangers carried away captive his forces, and foreigners entered into his gates and cast lots upon Jerusalem, even thou was as one of them. So we got to find out which one of them they are. 
because we know that the Syrians and, the, of course, the whole Babylonian kingdom was involved. So we did have Arabic forces attacking Israel, just like they're doing today. Just like Rome has all these relationships with all these Arabic nations all around them, and they just bow down and do whatever the Pope says. Now, I know people will say, well, they're killing a lot of the Christians that are in those nations, the, the Catholic people that are living there. That's what, you know, you would get the argument about it. Rome doesn't mind sacrificing some of their people to make it look good. You'd be surprised what they would do. Notice what he says next, though, verse 12. But thou shouldest not have looked on the day of thy brother and the day that he became a stranger, neither shouldest thou have rejoiced over the children of Judah in the day of their destruction. Now, it's clearly 70 A.D. The children of Judah, the house of Judah in the day of their destruction. Neither shouldest thou have spoken proudly in the day of distress. It gets, it's, it gets even better. Watch what else he says. Thou shouldest not have entered into the gate of my people in the day of their calamity. Yea, they shouldest not have looked upon their affliction in the day of their calamity, nor have laid hands on their substance in the day of their calamity. Now, I realize that the Roman Catholic Church was not built in 70 AD when Titus, the Roman general, was there. But clearly... The Ark of Titus that is in Rome today that depicts the temple treasures were carried back to what is called modern-day Rome. They were carried back there. Somewhere in those catacombs are the temple treasures, the menorah, etc. So God identifies that, though, not just as Romans, but as the descendants of Esau. So we clearly know that. Now... We go back. Now we're looking at this other scripture here. Not only is a root, see, another part of that evil root happens to be, lest any root of bitterness string up and trouble you, thereby many be defiled. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. That's Hebrews 12, 15. Now notice what he did. He sold his birthright. Why do you think that there is a love of money for Rome then? They're trying to buy back what they sold. Notice what else it says. Verse 17 in Hebrews chapter 12. For you know how that afterward when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. So see, as he sold his birthright, he's been trying to find a way to buy back God's favor, and he can't do it. And God gave us a sign. Not to mention he shows you that he, where Esau lives in Rome. He also speaks about how he will destroy them in Obadiah and other places as well. But it says again in 1 Timothy 6.10, For the love of money is the root of all evil. All evil then has a root that is Satan. It'll be the Antichrist spirit, and he has a desire of the love or the love of money, which while some coveted after they have erred from the faith, shows that he was part of the faith, but erred. In other words, he went away from the original gospel that Jesus Christ first spoke to his apostles, and we got the corruption of Constantine and the church and state religion, which by the way, in the United States, you're about to come under church and state religion. Uh, if you're already 501c, you're already owned by the state anyway. They own your church, and so you're not going to get to say a whole lot about anything in the first place. But the Vatican controls the United States as it is. It is just something else. But again, we have another incredible passage that identifies where the root of all evil is, and it's with money. Now, let me just share this with you. If you want to know about money in Rome, let me just share one of these things here with you. I looked at, I've looked at several article, articles, but this is just a little short one for you. The Roman Catholic Church is almost certainly the wealthiest organization in the world. Uh, in the United States alone, now this is, not, I actually, when I wrote the book, Israel, Are They Still God's People? I quoted from uh, the Vatican's and its billions uh, there's a book there that talks about the wealth of the Vatican, but this has this been updated since then. It is estimated that the Catholic Church has an operate, operating budget of $170 billion comparison in fiscal year 2012. All right, now that's, by the way, that's only the United States. $170 billion. 
Apple and General Motors each had about $150 billion in revenue worldwide. The Vatican, I think in the, in the book uh, when I wrote about this, um, the Vatican and its billions has more gold than all other countries. In the world. There's no country in the world that has more gold reserves than the Vatican does. They own stocks in practically every major corporation in the world. Their, their, their revenues, their spending, and not to mention their, their hard assets. In other words, like all the gold figurines and stuff in their churches around the world. They said it's impossible to put a value on the Vatican. It is so wealthy. And we also see that the Vatican, in, in bringing about a new world order, Using NATO, their allies, the United States, by the way, the United States can fight outside of, uh, of NATO. The Vatican uses them to conquer the world the way they need to. This is one reason why you see that this issue over Ukraine, uh, like we did in the report just the other day, um, Russia wanted to be a part of the economic structure. And Russia even asked back in November of 2013, let's do a negotiation over Ukraine and let's share in the economic structure there. The United States said no. They wouldn't even allow them to come to the negotiation table until after, you know, what, 4,000-something people were murdered. There's right and there's wrong. And clearly, there's a lot of things that have been done wrong. Now, the reason I bring up this part about Russia, though, is because the mark of the beast, and this is what we're going to be getting into in this special report, the mark of the beast is an economic control. It's an economic boycott of countries. That's what you're seeing that the Rome is doing now to the world. You see, they didn't want Russia a part of this economic system because Russia has not been conquered by the Vatican as of yet. The Pope of Rome has not gone to Russia, so therefore they're not conquered. And until Russia becomes conquered by Rome, Russia's, that's why they got the sanctions on them. But what's interesting is Israel is not cooperating in the sanctions. Israel is still doing business with Russia as normal. And yet, Israel has been conquered by the Vatican, but not the people. It's the same thing in the United States. The people of the United States have not been conquered by Rome, but the politics, the governmental system, has been conquered by Rome. That's why you're fixing to go under a major, major assault in the United States. This is why you're going to see the, uh, the global situation completely change. They're fixing to lock down America. They're going to lock down what you can and can't say. Freedom of religion will end. Be no different than Russia at that point. Anyway, I don't, I don't want to get into that as of yet. There, there's so much that I can say, and I want to say that for later. I, I just wanted to share this message with you because I thought it was just fascinating to see, again, another clear evidence that tells us where that Antichrist spirit sits at, where the Judas of today. And I know a lot of people say he's just a false prophet. You know, let me just say this in closing. It has been a campaign by the churches, the different denominational systems of today, Baptists, Methodists, Pentecostals, Presbyterians, those that, that, that have taught, especially in the evangelical movement, that have taught about the Antichrist, there's been a huge movement. Everybody keeps looking for this Antichrist to be some Arabic guy or some Prince Charles or, 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 or some world leader, young, charismatic guy to come along, and this is how the, the mark of the beast will be implemented, will be through him. Have you ever considered the possibility, especially now that you see all these churches that have, that have put out this doctrine to begin with, they're all joining with Rome now. Even the Assemblies of God. I actually attended an Assemblies of God church in South Florida. Just found out today from a friend of mine that, that goes there, uh, that had been attending there for a long time there, that they went, had a meeting, uh, the Assemblies of God had a meeting with Pope Francis, and they have joined in, and they are now starting to teach Catholic doctrines within the Assemblies of God. Now, the last one you'll probably see do this will be the United Pentecostals, because it's a bigger barrier for them, because of the way they believe in, their one, in, in the oneness doctrine, 
Uh, they're not Trinitarian, so it'll be harder for them to overcome, but they're going to have to do it or they're going to lose everything. Or you just have to become completely out of all of it. And they would lose everything because even the United Pentecostals are 501c organizations. They're owned by the state. Now, as I say this, though, all these churches that you guys have been part of, I was part of as well at one time, you've got to understand that they have been preaching to you that the Antichrist, the false prophet, are two different people all together, and that and some of them would, they can't even say that the false prophet has anything to do with the Catholic Church because it's against the 501c corporation guidelines. The United States says if you say anything against the Vatican, they can shut you down and take everything you got. So they got to give you some other Antichrist idea. And so they have brought that nonsense theology to your mind to get you to believe a lie. And it's very good. They've been very good at it. But what's going to happen when they begin to start the New World Order? The Pope of Rome is coming to the United States to speak to Congress, both houses of Congress. He's coming to speak to the United Nations, address a general assembly there, to kick off the one world government. This is where your liberties will be changed. This is why the churches are doing this come back home to the Catholic Church faith now. And it, from the outset of it, it, maybe it looks like a great thing. There come a time I can't say to you the things I'm saying now without going to jail. They're making it a crime right now. The evangelical organization in America has been considered a terrorist organization. That has been passed. And the people that pass that right now are trying to make it a criminal offense for you to say anything against the Catholic Church. Why do you think John Hagee joined up with them? Rick Warren. All these, you know, a lot of these people were just Jesuits, no doubt. I don't think John Hagee was. But they face losing everything they have. Many of them have very wealthy lifestyles. They're going to lose it all if they don't give in. And the mark of the beast will come so simply. You can't buy or sell. Not just saving you take the mark. Do you know you can have the name or the number of the name? Hmm. In other words, if you're Catholic, it's good enough. You're already part of the system. That's why he says, come out of her, my people, and be not partakers of her plagues. Where does it say, come out of the Antichrist? and be not partakers of her plagues. The plagues strike the one that is the Antichrist system. And the churches have been teaching you a lie so that when the time comes, taking the mark, if you're already looking for some, something else and it's not here yet, you'll think that it's not, that's not the mark of the beast yet. Microchip will maybe only facilitate this whole situation, but maybe they don't microchip everybody. You don't have to be just microchipped, you know. The mark of the beast, the number of his name or his name. There's more than one way. The scriptures clearly got it right there for you. It's serious, friends. It's very serious. God bless you. I trust this is helping you somewhat. Copy these messages. Please do. We know we don't have much more grace in saying what we're saying. We need your support. There's things we need to do to be able to get this message out further. I want to get a, a, a duplicator of like 10 where we can start making DVDs ourselves. But I encourage you to do it. Share them with your friends, everything you can. Because freedom of religion is coming to an end. And it's coming to an end. Shalom. I'm Stephen Benun with the New Institute of Biblical Research.